commissioners, are there any questions about any items on the proposed agenda? Are there any questions about any items on the agenda for the five o'clock meeting? Commissioners, I do have to add an item to the June 20th agenda. Okay. Five o'clock. It will be a budget amendment for to accept the MAP grant from the fiscal year 2022 to 2023. It covers a period from September 2022 to June 30th, 2023. Okay, great. So just uh, just give us a reminder at the beginning of the meeting uh, at five o'clock, and we'll add that to the agenda. We do need to add it by consensus, but it sounds like that should not be an issue. All right. Um, the first item on our agenda for the briefing meeting is the Wildlife Commission Resources Reports on Bold Bears. And Ashley Hobbs is here to present this item. Thanks for being with us. Yeah, come over to the, uh, come over to the uh, podium. And I should have some slides to show you as well. Okay, my name is Ashley Hobbs. I am officially titled Special Projects Biologist with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. Uh, my colleague Justin McVeigh here is, uh, he's here as well as the district biologist. Um, together, we kind of cover Buncombe County. Um, if you will, that's my jurisdiction. Uh, but it's a full-time job, and we see a lot more uh, human-bear interactions around the county in particular. Uh, and I wanted to kind of present some context to you guys. I know we gave you uh, a fact sheet of sorts, um, so hopefully we can pick through the high points of that and give you a little context about why feeding ordinance language and further steps are needed. So this is what we're seeing in Buncombe, a lot of attractant-based bear calls. Um, a lot of these calls can be remedied by simply not having a bird feeder, uh, securing a trash in a garage or an enclosed uh, uh, trash shed. Um, but this is the calls that we're getting. Uh, and a lot of this is driven by more people and more bears. Our mountain bear population is still growing somewhere around five to 6% each year. Uh, and in Asheville in particular, we're finding that um, it's acting as a source population for the surrounding mountain bear population. Our urban bear study shows that bears are in Asheville and let's be honest, Buncombe County as a whole, um, are, having bears, are having cubs earlier in life and they are uh, having more cubs per litter. So we have a high reproductive rate here in Asheville. Uh, and a lot of these calls um, are people who don't know how to coexist with bears. Um, so what we're finding is as our human population grows and our bear population grows, we're getting more interactions. That puts us in positions like these. So this is just the past three years but you can see uh, in red, that's the entire rest of North Carolina, and blue, that's Buncombe County. Uh, so on average, Buncombe's receiving about a third of the calls about bears each year statewide. Uh, that's anything from, I saw a bear on my ring doorbell camera, what do I do? To there's a bear hit by a car, what do I do? To there's a bear in my kitchen, what do I do? And kind of everything in between. Um, so we're seeing a lot of calls from Buncombe County, and that's actually how I got my job. Um, I am specifically assigned to Buncombe County, the only biologist with the commission that's assigned to a certain county for human wildlife uh, interactions. Uh, so we're getting a lot of calls. And again, most of these calls are attractant based and can be remedied through easy solutions like following the six bear wise basics. Um, beyond the volume of calls that we're receiving, um, we're receiving a, a more of an escalation in behavior in these calls as well. So you see we have uh, an uptick in entries into homes. Um, sometimes people are at home when these bears are entering. Uh, we're seeing a lot of threatening behaviors. This could be following people looking for a handout. This could be uh, repeatedly a bluff charging people in their community. Um, or this could be something even uh, you know, worse. So a lot of this is again attractant based. So we're also seeing a big uptick in intentional feeding reports as well. So these are people who love bears, they think bears need uh, you know, supplemental food resource, so they put out scraps in the backyard, they put out 
uh, deer corn for the bears, or they put out bird seed for the bears. Um, and a lot of these sorts of reports, these people intentionally feeding bears, are driving those more escalated bear behaviors that you see above. When we get bears in these sorts of situations, people are at risk and bears are at risk. Uh, one thing that we see is the number one source of mortality for bears in Buncombe County is vehicle collisions. Um, a good example happened just down the street, um, what was that, last weekend. Uh, and if we can secure attractants and do a reduction in some of these uh, escalated bear behaviors by securing attractants, retraining people so that we can retrain bear behavior, keep them moving through our communities rather than sticking around, uh, we can reduce some of those mortality factors. We can reduce some of those um, increased reproductive rates as well. Uh, so what are we doing when we respond to these escalated bear calls? Uh, we do a number of things. We take a multi-pronged approach here. One thing that we do immediately in nearly every case is promote BearWise. Uh, BearWise.org is a science-based, consistent uh, messaging tool that we use to promote coexistence with black bears. Um, it is a national program that we as a state agency buy into to participate in each year. So we always lead with education first. Um, but we also provide technical guidance as well. Uh, we want to give people non-lethal uh, techniques to deter bears. We use uh, electric fencing to exclude bears from places. Uh, unwelcome mats are a great tool. We'll always uh, we'll recommend hazing techniques as well to make bears feel uncomfortable. Um, so there's a lot of non-lethal techniques that we recommend. We'll also conduct aversive conditioning in some cases as well. This could look like less lethal rounds. This could look like pyrotechnics, uh, sirens, lights, things of that nature, depending on the situation. Uh, and last but not least, we will conduct site visits to homeowners, um, especially those people that are intentionally feeding bears. And this is kind of where we come in with some of this proposed uh, ordinance language. We'd like to stop that intentional feeding of bears to prevent habituation of bears where they lose their fear of people because they're constantly being rewarded for coming so close to us. And we also want to prevent food conditioning where they associate us as a source of food. Um, and here is, here we go. Here's an example, um, somebody screen recorded another person's Facebook account um, that's a big feeder in Fairview. And this is what we're seeing. This is of course a bit of a uh, escalated case here. This is a bit severe when it comes to intentional feeding. Um, but you'll see in some of these behaviors, not only are people at risk, uh, but the bears at risk as well because it's approaching people uh, and they're congregating unnaturally as well, which can promote disease transfer. Uh, so what we'll see my video stopped. Let me try that again. First of all, he's just coming up here wanting something to eat and bumming before it is doing. Realized I didn't have nothing. So again, if these bears are approaching people and being rewarded on a daily basis in this instance, uh, you know, they're going to approach another person who's not intentionally feeding, who's just going about their day in their backyard. And that puts, again, people and bears at risk. You see, they lose their fear of humans. He can approach them. See what happens. What are you doing? Eat the corn. Or you eat the corn. Uh, everybody eat the corn. So in this situation, there's not much we can do. Um, we can go out there. We can take our enforcement division with us. Uh, we can explain that it's dangerous for people. We can explain why it's dangerous for the bears as well but we cannot do anything to make this sort of situation stop currently. Um, so that's part of the reason why we are proposing we start with a feeding ordinance. Um, you know, along these lines too, when bears are becoming habituated in food condition, we're seeing bears and people are making physical contact more often. Um, so nine times in Buncombe County compared to uh, what is it, seven times in the entire rest of the state. So it doesn't happen very often, but it is happening more frequently. Um, luckily, we haven't had a very severe case just yet. Um, but if we don't nip this in the bud now, this statistic is only going to get worse. 
So in order to address these things, we are taking, again, a multi-pronged approach. Um, we're asking people to secure garbage, not only through bear resistant carts, but through trash enclosures, um, simply putting out your trash the morning of collection instead of the night before. Same thing with attractants, you know, livestock feed, and putting that behind a, 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 a electric fence. Doing tons of bearwise outreach wherever I can plug bearwise, I do, especially in Buncombe County. Uh, we're addressing knowledge gaps in our uh, in our bear population and how all these supplemental attractants affect our bears here through the urban bear study. Uh, and then of course we're doing uh, a lot of promotion of wildlife feeding ordinances. Montreat just adopted an ordinance. Uh, City of Asheville just adopted some new ordinance language. Uh, they're also looking at trash ordinances as well, uh, particularly in Montreat. And then in the rare case where we do have a bear that's deemed uh, particularly aggressive and is a threat to human safety, uh, we will have to remove that bear. We don't relocate bears in North Carolina. Uh, it's not an effective management tool for bears or people, and it doesn't address the root of the problem. So if we have to go out and trap a bear, we will have to put that bear down. Again, a very, very rare situation that we encounter, uh, but that is on the table if we don't address this uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, what do we recommend? Uh, we need help. That's, it's, this is how we need help. Um, the bear resistant cart program is excellent. Uh, we see a lot of people are confused with how to get carts if they're still available. We're getting a lot of mixed messaging. So expanding that bear resistant uh, program, cart program out so that it's more available to residents of Buncombe uh, and maybe even finding ways that we can supplement some of the cost um, would be excellent as well. We again would love to see some feeding ordinance language put in place so we can address uh, situations like you saw in that video. Uh, and we also would love to uh, incorporate you guys in, in promoting some of this Bearwise information. That's probably one of the easier parts here. Um, Bearwise is prepackaged, ready to go, uh, consistent, science-based, so you're always getting the right message out. You're always pointing people towards a vetted resource. Um, so social media, it's ready to go. Um, there's articles online. Bearwise.org is a wonderful resource. So we'd love to incorporate that as well. And last but not least, promote our NC Wildlife Helpline as the go-to source when you need help for bears. Um, hopefully this will offset some of the burden on emergency services for the county and the city um, and point people towards us so that we can provide um, you know, technical guidance and uh, go out and do site visits, things like that uh, when it's deemed necessary. So this is what I recommend and I'm really happy that you guys uh, had us today. Um, we're really grateful that you guys uh, are coming to the table and willing to work with us on some of these things because as you can see, we really need it. <clears throat> All right, uh, great job, Ashley. Uh, commissioners, um, any questions? Yes, I have um, a couple of questions for you. So around the bird feeders, you talked about the active time because we know people love their birds and they love mm -hmm. their bird feeders and we realize that that is part of what's attracting. But you specifically mentioned that it's okay for them to have it out part of the year but not necessarily during the active time. Can you give us that time frame of when you consider that active time to be? Yeah, so to clarify, we would recommend no bird feeders. Uh, that is the recommendation, <laughs> that is the party line. No That's gonna feeders. be a tough one. Uh, however, if you are really attached to your bird feeder, um, there's a multitude of different ways to attract birds, um, different species of birds, wider quantities of birds as well through things like pollinator gardens, uh, water features. Um, and if you have to, have to use a bird feeder, we recommend you do it from around, you bring in that bird feeder from St. Patrick's Day to around Thanksgiving is kind of a good uh, frame of reference there. That's when bears are least active. Um, our bears don't hibernate in the winter. They're not unconscious in a cave like you know TV may lead you to believe. Uh, so you will see a bear out in January. That's not necessarily uncommon around here. Uh, so yeah, if you can kind of aim for that time period to bring in your bird feeder uh, until Thanksgiving, uh, that's a good rule of thumb. And thank you. The other thing is we have an excellent composting program. And I feel like if we can get more people aware of that, because then they would not need to put their any of the food products in their trash can, which is what's mostly attracting them to the trash cans, correctly? Sure. Any way we can exclude a bear from a trash can, you know, we fully support that. Um, also, minimizing some of the smells, kind of mm -hmm. like you're referencing, is always a good rule of thumb, too. Um, and composting, you know, that kind of benefits everybody, so it's a great program to c incorporate. Yeah, and I think just for folks to know, this isn't about even composting in your own backyard with Buncombe County and Asheville have a compost program and so you can drop it off at several of our libraries as well as other places and then that way it would keep all of those food products out of the garbage, which as you said has multiple benefits. Um, 
those were just my two main questions around that. And I know I think we're going to get into potential ordinance language maybe or as well. Okay. I actually have another question. Um, I appreciate your presentation, and I understand you don't capture aggressive bears. What do you do, though, when people report injured bears? I know in the area where I work in town, there's been an injured mama bear with four cubs. Mm -hmm. What... Near, near your home. My house. She came to your house, too. Um, and so I'm just curious um, how you address that. Um, yeah, so in that particular case, which it sounds like it may be the same bear there. Yeah. Um, the same. Okay, so in that particular case with an adult black bear, they're ineligible for rehab. Um, so we find that when you bring a wild adult bear into captivity for rehabilitation, it's extremely uh, stressful for them. Um, it's also, you know, can inhibit some of their healing time in the case of an injury. Um, so in our state, we don't rehabilitate adult black bears. Uh, we're not aware of any state in the U.S. that does. Uh, and in our state, it's actually part of our state rule that we cannot rehabilitate adult black bears. So now, in the she, case of cubs, yes, we do have options available here in the mountains and out at the zoo. Um, and in some cases, uh, with yearling bears as well, we may consider rehab. So she just lives the rest of her life. Yeah, bears are really hardy, resilient creatures. Oftentimes, if we give them a chance to heal, um, they tend to go on and live their life. They reproduce, have many litters, uh, and they do just fine. I think I have a question about trash cans. Um, I know on, on your website you show offerings of, I guess, aftermarket trash mm -hmm. cans that are bear-proof, which I guess may or may not be able to be used by, depending on who your trash pickup service right. is. Um, so I guess my question is, do you know, can you think of or know of an example in, in this state or otherwise of a community of our size that has, I guess, a widespread bear-proof yep. trash can program? So there's been actually research to back this up. Um, there's a few communities like Durango in Colorado, uh, which I really encourage you to check out. Uh, when they introduced um, bear-resistant trash cans, they trained people how to use them properly because you got to have the human component there as well. Um, they found a significant re reduction in human interactions uh, with bears in town. So it has been proven there's a lot of research out there to support bear resistant trash cans. It seems, and I could be, I've been wrong before, it seems like intuitively that it's the trash cans, the municipal trash cans that is like the most by volume interaction point between humans and, <clears throat> and bears. Is that? Yeah, I would say yeah. uh, wildlife feeding and trash are the two big ones for Asheville and Buncombe County. I mean, you know, so the current program, people can opt into it, mm -hmm. right? But it, they're pretty expensive. Right. So I, I don't know if uh, there's any strategies around there to kind of get the cost down on that or if that's just, yeah. it is what it is. Because it's, it, you know, some, some, some people do do that, but they're, it's simply not an option for a lot of people. Exactly. So, um, um, you know, Justin and I joke a lot of the times that we are almost trash biologists more than we're bear biologists sometimes. Um, it's a really complex issue. You know, you have uh, trash and sanitation services that we have to, you know, account for their workers and what can they accommodate in terms of trash can models and how the different locks and things function. Um, then you have price that you have to consider as well. And you want something that will withstand the test of time and most importantly, keep bears out. Um, so we have tested the uh, model that the county is currently using, a uh, city as well, it's the same model. Uh, we've tested that with Uno the Bear at the Nature Center and it passed the test. We've had a lot of success with that model, but it is expensive. Um, so some things that we're looking at are what we call retrofits or locks that you can install uh, on your current trash can, just a regular trash cart. Um, to hopefully cut down on some of the costs for people, make it more accessible. But then again, we have to consider sanitation services as well, and will that work on their end? So it's a complex issue that we're always trying to find solutions to. Um, and trash enclosures are another way we can go. G storing trash in a garage is another option. Um, but it is really complex. Yep. Have, has, has your team talked with folks from um, the Buncombe County Solid Waste Department or Waste Pro about those issues? Um, briefly here and there, especially when the CART program first came to fruition, we chatted a little bit. Um, but yeah, we, we've worked with the city mostly to test the cans uh, and really vet the model that's been used. Okay. It seems like that may be a worthwhile conversation Absolutely. to continue. You know, we're, we're in processes for 
Well, we've actually kind of extended our contracts out, but I'm sure that you know this would be an area where um, we'd love to see if there's some other solutions. Yeah, and even expanding to dumpsters, things yeah. like communal living situations, you know, those are important as well. Um, Short-term rentals are important as well when it comes to trash. Um, there's a lot of different things to address. Um, we can make a list for sure. Yeah. And on the ordinance uh, issue, so I hmm. we have a couple of slides we wanted to show okay. you. Okay, great. <clears throat> Hello, Chairperson Newman and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Kurt Euler. I am here to talk about some county efforts regarding Bearwise program that may fill in some of the blanks uh, from the state's presentation. Um, do we have the power slides? Okay, ah, wonderful. Okay, so first thing to address the bear carts. Uh, Waste Pro does have bear uh, bear trash carts available to Waste Pro customers at a cost, as you can see uh, from the PowerPoint, it's $10.96 a month or $321 to buy it permanently. Uh, according to uh, that, there are a thousand customers in Buncombe County that have these uh, bear trash cans, and uh, there's currently no wait list for people who want them and they are expecting to get another 100 of these cans in the next month, these special cans. Um, in terms of public outreach, the county is uh, going full force with the Bearwise uh, campaign on its social media sites. Uh, we're also handing out flyers and other information through uh, community engagement marketplaces uh, and Finally, we uh, want to add uh, some Bearwise programming to uh, our podcast and BCTV. So we're trying to get the word out. Um, the thing that I am most here to talk about today is proposed changes to our animal control ordinance. Currently, our animal control ordinance does, does prohibit feeding uh, of any animal when it becomes a public nuisance or when it becomes a threat to public health, safety, or welfare of the community. It's a one sentence thing. Um, what we would do is we would propose, we looked at a, a bunch of various ordinances and we liked uh, what the city of Asheville did and our, or, our animal control ordinance and the city's animal control ordinances are very similar. So what we would do is we would add to our animal control ordinance a definition of attractant which basically would state an attractant means any substance which could reasonably be expected to attract a wild animal or animals or does not, uh, including but not limited to food products, pet food, feed or grain. And then we would basically add to our ordinance uh, this section up here, which basically prohibits uh, the, the feeding or attracting of wild animals. Um, it does not prohibit bird feeders unless the bird feeder becomes an attractant. And basically our animal control ordinance would, or our animal control officer would be able to go out to a site, assess the site, basically ask the people to quit feeding the animals or take down their bird feeders. And if they don't comply, then they could issue a civil citation. So, Currently, we, the, the animal control officer does, we're not really specific about bears. Um, we would add uh, bears into this uh, to make it specific, but we would, this would be applicable to all wild animals. One question on that sure. language. I'm curious, there, the feeding or attracting of animals wild or domesticated, is there a reason you included domesticated? Well, there could be a problem with feeding. It, wild animals is specifically defined in the ordinance and excludes animals that, that, that may be domesticated. So we, we wanted to cover both. Um, so wild and domesticated would basically cover both. Those are the two main kind of classes of animals in our animal control ordinance. Can I ask, is there any 
limitation on, I guess it would have to be someone specifically with animal control that we're hoping will enforce this. This isn't something that we generally would want folks just randomly getting citations for. It would be specific to the statute with folks who are trained to. No, it, it, what it would require is not only just the feeding, but that the feeding creates a, a public health or a, a public health problem. So there, there would have to be those two components before there would be any enforcement. And there would be that third layer of asking the person to stop before moving forward with any citation. <clears throat> so if the, so our, if, if staff, um, I'm sorry, if the commissioners would like us to, uh, to, to make such an amendment, we can have something prepared for the July 18th uh, commissioner meeting. I'm happy to answer any other questions that you may have. I'm supportive of looking at that language and updating the language. Yep, let's, let's put it on the agenda for consideration. All right, Kurt, thanks so much. Thank you very um, much. And um, Ashley, uh, maybe the, the yeah. oh yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you guys for being here. Appreciate your helping to bring some additional attention to this issue. Um, so look forward to working with you and considering the ordinance. Yep. All right, um, the next item on the agenda <clears throat> is the expansion, uh, proposed Medicaid expansion. And Stoney Blevins and Philip Harden are here to present this item. Good afternoon, Commissioner Stoney Blevins, Health and Human Services Director. And uh, it's been a while since we talked about this. I believe I was here on April 4th to give you an update and we just wanted to come back and uh, let you know what's going on as we're approaching the new fiscal year. So just a little bit of background, we went over this in our April 4th meeting, but for those who maybe weren't here, might be in the room or watching on TV, just a little background about Medicaid, just to say this, basically a, med a federally funded uh, insurance program. It's um, administered by the same federal agency that administers Medicare, although they're not the same. So a lot of times people think they are. Medicare is attached to Social Security. It's basically for those who are disabled or over 65. Whereas Medicaid, uh, depending on the state, could be available for any citizen that meets income guidelines. Uh, expansion uh, began in June of 2012 when, um, with the Affordable Care Act. And since that time, 40 states have expanded Medicaid coverage in their state to cover all ages, with North Carolina being the most recent one to do that uh, as of March 27th of this year. Uh, just continue to point out the fact that Medicaid expansion actually cannot begin, so we cannot begin accepting applications for Medicaid expansion until we have a state budget. So that's what we're waiting on now before we actually open those applications up uh, to citizens. In terms of our data, um, the North Carolina Division of Health Benefits has run some analytics and they believe uh, Buncombe County will have an estimated almost 15,500 additional citizens who would be eligible for Medicaid under expansion. And just as I mentioned below, these will primarily be for folks uh, over 18, under 65, uh, that are below 133% of the poverty level. Uh, that Just put that in numbers for you, that's about $34,000 a year of income for a family of three. Uh, and this will be an increase, uh, almost a 30% increase if it proves to be true over our current Medicaid caseload, which is just under 70,000 um, recipients in Buncombe County. We've been analyzing our workload ever since we got these numbers. We believe to fully implement Medicaid expansion, if we were to move up to that number, we would require about 34 additional staff, uh, and that covers all kinds of staff, direct service staff, or supervisors when we add those staff, quality assurance and training, those kind of things. Talk about the financial overview. So all Medicaid, just to make it clear, any Medicaid, the Medicaid we, we, we provide to citizens today is uh, funded at 75% of federal uh, funds. So the federal government provides a 75-25 match to all counties in North Carolina, and then counties provide the other 25%. Um, a little bit different in expansion because the General Assembly in that expansion bill set aside some monies, some state monies, to help pay for expansion activities at the county level around uh, uh, enrolling people. Uh, they put a $4 million one-time statewide 
bonus in there for counties and then a 1.667 million per month that could also go to counties to help cover that 25% cost for these additional cases. We've received um, word this past month that the 4 million as well as May through September of that 1.667 is going to be front loaded. So we should have that money in hand by the end of this month so that counties can go ahead and start hiring and preparing uh, for the influx of applications that they'll receive. For us, that is going to be about just a little over $408,000 for state fiscal year 24 and then about 536000 in state fiscal year 25. The funding allocation will change a little bit in the next year. So what we would propose to do in terms of initial staffing to get ahead of the influx is to go ahead and hire half of the staff that we propose we'll need for full implementation. This will allow us to get started with no county, um, no county investment. This will be to use the funds that we're receiving from the state. And uh, you can see we're basically front loading on direct client facing staff so that we can receive and process these applications. In addition, we'll need another supervisor to manage that caseload and we'll need a trainer to sort of train this heavy influx of new staff and get them ready um, before, before our folks start coming in. So next steps, uh, the revenue expenditure and positions for expansion are included in the fiscal year 24 ordinance that you will be uh, loading on tonight. Uh, we'll begin conducting recruitment, onboarding, onboarding and monitoring process. And then we'd like to keep you guys updated on a regular basis. We want to do a graduated approach. So we'll be monitoring our caseload increase constantly once Medicaid expands and we can begin taking them so that we can give you a report on exactly how many more recipients are coming in the door, what that means for staffing, what that means for quality assurance and those kind of things. So any questions? Thanks for this update, it's really helpful. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, what you all anticipate in terms of the 15,000 or so folks who are eligible but not yet enrolled, kind of how they are likely to onboard into this and um, what kind of approaches you all anticipate, what kind of challenges? Well, I think the approaches are, the, it'll be the same process that other folks use to, to enter into Medicaid. So they'll have to apply. They can come and apply in person in our office at 40 Cox Avenue. Uh, you can apply online through North Carolina ePass. It's an online application process. Or you can apply over the telephone if you can't get into the office. So we'll use the same format. As far as getting the word out, uh, we'll do media campaign. We'll work with CAPE. I'm sure the state of North Carolina will be putting out information. We'll, we'll even um, use our website, social media, those kind of things. I think our partners really will help us spread the word as well. I've talked to a lot of them. So... Pisca Legal is willing to help us spread the word because they'll be doing Affordable Care Act, you know, at a similar time. So they can really begin to educate people on the fact they might be eligible for Medicaid this year. Our FQHCs, who primarily serve the uh, uninsured population, will be helping us spread the word. Uh, someone could actually apply at the FQHC at a visit on a computer there. Uh, we believe that our homeless provider network will be instrumental in helping us enroll people that would now be eligible for Medicaid who haven't. So we have a pretty multi-tiered approach once we get the go-ahead to start receiving those applications. And then, thank you for that. And then it, it estimated 75,000 people in Buncombe County will be on Medicaid if we have full enrollment. Yes, it will put us right it's at about a third of thousand, or just under 30% of the county's population. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman, Commissioners. I'm here to provide a quarterly update. So it was about three months ago that I was last here uh, providing an update on the activities of the Homeless Initiative Advisory Committee. Uh, so we're back again to fill you in on what's been happening since uh, we last discussed this item. So as you'll recall, and for the benefit of those uh, watching or here today, um, the city, county, and Dogwood uh, undertook a collaborative effort um, to study 
homelessness and how to address uh, issues of homelessness within our community. That was known as the Within Reach study uh, that was released uh, publicly on January 25th, um, so just a few months ago. That study did outline, um, and you'll see in front of you, or should see in front of you, a copy of a printed kind of table that outlines uh, a number of recommendations. They were classified into short, medium, or long-term recommendations. And so what we've put in front of you today are just really the short-term recommendations. Uh, what is meant by that is activities that are anticipated to be undertaken uh, begun or completed kind of within that 12-month window, so really through February of 2024. Uh, there are 38 short-term tasks which were identified um, as part of that study. There are 18 of those, so nearly half are currently under some status of progress, meaning uh, they're part of an activity that's being undertaken by HIAC or uh, one of its work groups, uh, or will be something that will be advanced by the work group or broader uh, committee. So you notice that um, in what's provided in your printout and, and here we highlight that the governance work group is really working on nine of the tasks. There are a lot of things that are really high level um, organizational structure, who should be engaged in what kind of decision making activities. So a lot of the recommendations really touch on governance. Um, there are a number of short term tasks associated with outreach and encampments, um, including creating a work group to study those kinds of activities. So that was one of those short-term recommendations. Um, and then coordinated entry and shelter uh, work group. Those both have one task, but they're very significant. Um, so the number of tasks doesn't underscore the significance of them, but just kind of what they're tasked with working on at this time. Uh, and then I will highlight that there were two short-term tasks um, that really were requesting a response from the county as an independent entity from HIAC, um, and those were associated with the creation of the homelessness position and, and in responding to um, the Within Reach study. So as you recall, um, the board did create a homelessness program manager position. Um, which we are currently seeking to fill. But in the interim time, staff are acting as a resource and support for these efforts um, through a collection of us in the Community Development Division. So there are, as I said, some deliverables. So tasks don't always mean that you're gonna produce a deliverable, uh, but they feed into deliverables that are anticipated. And what I've listed on this slide are the five short-term um, deliverables that we anticipate will come out of this task work that the work groups are undertaking. Um, they are ordered in kind of when we anticipate that that deliverable will be realized. Uh, those include a draft charter from the governance work group, um, as well as a shelter capacity expansion proposal. That'll be phased. I'll talk a little bit more about kind of what that work group is undertaking. Um, coordinated entry standards, policies, and procedures followed by encampments resolution policy and then a street outreach collaboration plan. Um, these are kind of listed in terms of when they would anticipate to be produced or received. They're going along and working at the same time. The pace may be different um, and the need for the deliverable may be different. Uh, there's a high priority on, for example, producing the draft charter that will redefine the governance and set in place a new architecture on which they can build policy making and other decisions that are necessary. So that's a very high priority item. Shelter capacity expansion is also a high priority item, um, meeting the needs of those who are currently unsheltered. Uh, obviously, the point of the Within Reach study was addressing homelessness, and we do have um, residents and individuals within our community who are homeless and cannot access um, shelter with current capacity. So, I was going to take a look at each work group with you and kind of give you a status of what the work groups are doing. Again, HIAC um, is actively continuing its regular business and has created four separate work groups to really dig into these issues. They are reporting back regularly um, to HIAC every month what they've undertaken or completed and where they are with delivering uh, their work. And then HIAC will ultimately make the decision in terms of receiving any kind of recommendations or requested action on what those are. Um, so the first work group is governance. Um, they are char charged with developing a draft charter. They have completed a number of activities. Um, I am currently involved with that work group as well as Jen Teague, um, who is our HIAC representative um, and member. And within that work group, 
They have completed reviewing other communities' charters. Um, so the, the goal is not to reinvent the wheel. There are a number of successful communities which are highlighted by the Within Reach study. Uh, so we're looking at those charters. Uh, there was an activity to compare and contrast uh, board committee and work groups. So there are a number of things that you need to actually effectively uh, produce the work. So looking at those uh, structures within peer um, continuum of care. There was also an inventory of the existing landscape of the homelessness system. So looking at our provider networks, uh, our nonprofits, uh, and other agencies that are working in the space to understand what our community has, which is unique uh, and or similar to other peer communities. We are currently in the process of drafting a charter. Um, there are a number of elements of a charter which are fairly um, regular or not atypical from what you might see. The real meat of the recommendations, the, the, the more difficult part to produce, uh, are recommendations surrounding what the board composition, um, what the committees and work groups might look like uh, in order to effectively deliver on the within reach study and also future um, programs and activities that um, HIAC might wish to undertake. The target is to send a draft charter to HIAC in July. Um, so there are a few weeks left uh, and a, a couple of more meetings scheduled in order to produce uh, a draft for HIAC's consideration. So um, next steps really with this work group are getting that charter in front of um, HIAC. They'll make a determination as to you know, how they receive that, if there's additional work they would like us to undertake as a work group and advise them further. Um, ultimately, the goal would be for them to adopt a new charter and then transition into operating under that new structure, whatever that might look like. Um, and then we anticipate practically that the governance work group would effectively be eliminated at completion of that that activity, their job would be complete. The next work group um, is the shelter work group. And, and where possible, um, and of course, Commissioner Beach Ferrara sits on this work group, as does uh, Rachel Sawyer Nygaard and Jake Eckberg um, with community development. So there are a number of staff and elected officials involved in this work group. Uh, in reviewing kind of their work, we were able to identify kind of a two or excuse me, a three-step process. The first was understanding um, existing capacity and also potential models. So they've completed a lot of work in that space, doing uh, shelter tours, um, doing phone call interviews. There was a process to request a letter of interest, to, so to reach out to our existing providers and understand their capacity um, and potential interest in expanding um, their shelter operations and reviewing those letters uh, to learn from it what they could. Then step two was to identify potential partner or partners to increase that shelter bed capacity. Um, so there is a real push to, to move this forward um, and have something in place by October in terms of increased capacity before the winter months. Um, so to date, they've completed the request for partnership uh, proposal issuance. So they sent that to HIAC, who then released that officially, approved that. Um, and then they've actually um, received those proposals and begin the process now of reviewing and scoring. Um, and their target is to make a recommendation to HIAC at the same meeting that we're coming forward with charter um, recommendations, but in July um, to try to get some increased shelter capacity uh, before the winter months set in. Um, the third step, which is kind of a longer term goal, and this is the first short term goal that they're trying to reach is to increase capacity for the winter months, but is to look um, to identify any other process to meet the larger need beyond this first process, right? So how do we create additional capacity beyond that first set of goals uh, before winter? Um, so with the shelter work group, their next steps are to bring those recommendations to HIAC. Hayek would need to determine its you know, position on those recommendations. It is the decision-making entity. And then um, in the event that they do have uh, a project or proposal they wish to move forward for with, they would then need to identify and seek any funding necessary to support that kind of activity. Um, so that would happen at the Hayek level. Uh, and then the next two work groups, so the first is the coordinated activity work group. Um, they have completed their first step, which was to develop an interim coordinated entry guidance. So just making sure that we have some basic guidance on coordinated entry and how that would function. 
And then their longer term goal with more steps is really uh, to develop a long term coordinated entry standards, policies and procedures. So they've completed a number of, of tasks, including reviewing community feedback on, on the assessments and work plan, um, identifying current access points. So again, understanding the landscape in which we're operating and what's unique about um, Asheville and Buncombe County. Um, they've compared a centralized versus decentralized model of coordinated entry. So there are a couple of models that are standards that um, you might use in addressing coordinated entry, which is the entry point for uh, homeless individuals into the system. Right now, that work group is updating um, the co coordinated entry process to follow HUD's core elements. So HUD defines some core elements there, which are access, assessment, prioritization, and referral. So they're in the middle of that work. Um, that is anticipated to take a little bit uh, longer. So we don't yet have an exact date, um, but we are anticipating sometime in the fall um, that we would receive um, some information from them to HIAC. So again, very similar processes, right? These are work groups, so they're going to bring forward a recommendation. Hayek would make a determination um, on those recommendation, and then they would seek to um, identify how and funding that they might be able to use to implement any recommendations uh, that they, as a full board, are interested in pursuing. And then finally, the outreach and encampments work group. Um, so these. Uh, are two related tasks, um, and though it says outreach and encampments, they're really looking at things first from the encampment perspective and then from outreach and response to uh, encampment. The first step is the drafting of an encampment resolution policy. This is specifically called for in the within reach study. Uh, so at this point, they have reviewed other communities encampment response and policy examples. Um, They've divided into four teams to draft sections. So these will be you know, a comprehensive uh, policy. So they are drafting uh, sections, um, or broken into teams to draft the sections. They are currently in process of drafting those sections. Um, they are also engaging with local law enforcement um, and learning about the issues that are, are present with encampment resolution from a law enforcement perspective. The target is to have a draft policy to HIAC uh, in August. And then once that draft policy has moved forward, they'll move into the next phase, which is looking at um, the outreach component. So really um, developing a plan on how to address encampments, encampments with outreach with our existing network. Um, and that date has yet to be determined. So kind of that first step of um, encampment resolution policy will be necessary to move forward with that, that process. So again, these, these are a little bit different. So HIAC isn't necessarily in a position um, to adopt a policy on encampment. It's really endorsing a policy um, and then encouraging other entities like local government and law enforcement um, to actually you know, adopt a, a policy. So they would be receiving that information as HIAC, reviewing it, endorsing it, and then engaging um, with um, those entities on adoption. Uh, that's part of why you see reference that engagement currently with law enforcement, um, because that would be a critical component in terms of how you actually effectively uh, move forward with a policy. And then again, the other uh, aspect is an outreach collaboration plan. That is something that they could endorse or adopt um, that plan and then they would seek as an entity, HIAC, to actually implement the plan. It would be their plan in terms of, of how the system might respond. So that is the update really. Uh, as I mentioned, the work groups are tasked with a lot of these very in-depth activities as HIAC continues to produce its regular expected work. Um, and they are engaging with the work groups through those monthly reports. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that I can about any of the work groups um, and their activities, as well as, as HIAC's activities since our last meeting. All right, thanks, Matt. Commissioners, any questions? Yes, I have one question, and you may have said it, Matt, and I just missed it, but the coordinated entry, I know when we went to Raleigh and Chapel Hill and toured both of those um, shelters, they talked about how important that coordinated entry piece was, and so, do we have an, 
expected target date of when we'll have that in place with the coordinated entry? So there isn't a, a set month. We are much closer on a couple of the other activities. Um, we are thinking it would be in the fall. Um, that is not to underscore any of the work. All of them are critical, right? And so there's been some prioritization about which things to produce first. But I, I will say that HIAC and the members of the work group recognize it's critical that individuals can access the system. So this is a high priority. Um, and as I said, I would anticipate in the fall. Okay, thank you. And I'm definitely interested in hearing more about the shelter bed capacity of Commissioner Beach Ferrara. Yeah, of course. And Matt, thank you for the comprehensive update. Um, so as Matt um, described, the RFP has closed and we've received a, a set of proposals from um, uh, applicants. The sort of prompt that was put out there was um, based on the recommendations from NAH, which included that we bring on an additional um, 60 emergency shelter beds for single adults, 10 beds for family units, and 25 sort of medical treatment beds, um, which is 95 beds in total. And so the premise of this RFP um, basically was to um, see how many of those beds we could solicit proposals for and then assess kind of how strong those seem and bring at least some um, additional capacity online as, as quickly as possible. The, the concept being really to extend the success of last year's Code Purple, which was probably the most robust, most coordinated version of Code Purple our community has seen, um, and, and really build on that as sort of part of the scaffolding of continuing to expand capacity. So what we're anticipating is that this RFP, um, of course, will go to HIAC for, the, the, the recommendations for the group will go to HIAC, um, but that what will come in the pipeline to county commission is a funding request to help bring additional shelter beds online. And it will also help us zero in on what additional beds will be needed to get to that recommended level. Um, so just kind of previewing a couple things as, as based on that timeline, which would have some new beds coming online this fall, but also still gap. Um, the potential timeline of the coordinated access happening this fall. Um, additional supportive housing coming online this fall. We're sort of starting to see, I think, a coalescence of some of the key strategies that we've been investing in, um, which will help us, I think, again, um, serve more people who are in crisis, which is, which is a top goal, um, and do it in a way that's more coordinated and integrated, um, but also get an increasingly focused understanding of what the needs are and how we need to be thinking about the best way to meet them in a sustainable and long-term way. Um, so I'd love to keep sharing updates with you all as, as the working group really digs in on these proposals and, um, and, and also where our thinking is heading around the longer-term, more sustainable solutions, which are, just to kind of lift this up quickly, um, hopefully can be driven more by the question of how we do this work in the most effective, streamlined, impactful way, which is, a different question than how individual providers can respond to a need to bring on new beds, if that makes sense. Um, they may have overlapping answers, but they're sort of different starting points in terms of questions. So um, a bit of, a bit of um, context there. I'm always happy to talk more about this, as folks know, perhaps too happy to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, but I appreciate the opportunity for the conversation today. And again, hope in August we can um, come back or we'll have some issues in front of us to talk more about. All right. Uh, thanks, Jasmine. Thanks, Matt. Great updates. Uh, the last item on our agenda is an update on the Inca recreation destination and Woodfin Greenways. And Allison Danes is here to present this. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Um, I really do appreciate the opportunity to update you all today on two large projects that we've been working on in the Parks and Recreation Department, the Greenway, uh, Woodfin Greenway and Blue Way, and the Enca Recreation Destination. Um, there we go. Um, I'd like to start off with the uh, Woodfin Greenway and Blue Way. Um, First and foremost, I want to let you know that this is a great collaboration between many community partners, the town of Woodfin, the TDA, the MPO, as well as Buncombe County. 
Um, and so it's been a, a really great project. Uh, there's four main goals for the Woodfin Greenway and Blueway project, including transportation and connectivity, health and wellness benefits that come from outdoor recreation, which also promotes physical activity and social emotional wellness, gives the region an economic boost with a unique destination that features an attractive and local community and regional uh, amenities that are recreation and nature, equity and inclusion through connectivity and the restoration and preservation of important riverbeds, better air quality, and recreation experiences that are open to all. There's several components to this project, including the Silver Line Park, the Riverside Park expansion, which has two components known as the Wave and Riverside Park, and the Woodfin Greenway. To start off with the Silver Line Park, it was completed by the town of Woodfin as the project lead in May of 2022. It has park amenities, including a shelter, boat ramp, ADA accessible playground and walkways. There's also plans for permanent public restrooms in fiscal year 24 and other additional recreational amenities. You can also see here where they have put in a um, 10 foot walking path that will also connect to portion of the greenway through this piece of property. The Riverside Park expansion is a project on the French Broad River that is being led by the town of Woodfin. It includes two components, the construction of the Whitewater Wave and expansion of Riverside Park. The wave will be located adjacent to Riverside Park along the new Woodfin Greenway and it'll created from a fully designed and engineered ledge feature made of natural rock and concrete that'll include a kayaking and surfing river wave. Currently, Woodfin is in the permitting stage of this project and looking to go out to an RFP for construction in the coming months along with Riverside Park fiscal year 24. The town of Woodfin plans to expand the current Riverside Park, which sits on the French Broad, just south from four to eight acres. This renovation will mean a generous park expansion project with connections to the wave project, river access, environmental restoration in the park, changing in restrooms, and an overlook pavilion and extended parking. Anticipated construction will be approximately 18 months from construction award for full completion anticipated sometime in fiscal year 24. And you can see here a great rendering view of what that park expansion will look like along with the river wave. Then we come to the Woodfin Greenway which is a project that uh, Parks and Recreation Department is currently overseeing. There are two components to this project, the Highway 251 Section A, which you can see down here at the lower end of the, uh, the picture. It's approximately three miles of greenway that begins at the intersection of Broadway and Riverside Drive. The French Broad River section will follow the river north to Beaverdam Creek. At that point, we'll hit the second section known as Beaver Dam Creek, section B here. It's approximately two miles, and this section will follow the creek upstream through a wooded and secluded gorge at the base of Reynolds Mountain. I'd like to take the opportunity to talk about phasing projects of greenways right now um, as they're currently done in Buncombe County in order to give you an understanding of the process for completing greenway projects such as this because I know that there's um, oftentimes where you're not getting a lot of information and it feels like there's not a movement. But I want to assure you, there's been a great deal of movement on the Woodfin Greenway in particular. So first off, when we're doing greenways in the county, the way that they're run is first you need to have a feasibility study that's done. Feasibility study can take anywhere from um, 12 to 18 months. Then we do um, become a prioritization project on the STIP or on the MTP. Once we've done that, we have to secure local matching funds for that. Um, then we hire a consultant team through an RFP process for design. We go into preliminary engineering. Then we go to right of way where plans and acquisitions are finalized. And then finally we get to construction. So the big understanding here is that steps one, two, three, and four are really done kind of behind the scenes with preliminary engineering is when we start doing a lot more reaching out to the community for getting in, input from um, what we'd like to see. And I wanna point out that the Woodfin project has experienced some of the delays 
um, that have put us a little bit behind, but we're getting right back on track now. So some of these delays have been based on several factors, including delays in task orders, which are submitted through the NCDOT for approval, staff vacancies, and trial alignment challenges that have been overcome and we'll discuss in another slide. Preliminary engineering was at 25% design complete in October of 2022, at which point we held a public engagement meeting with more than 40 participants and over 600 views on the survey site. 86% of the people at this um, facility meeting um, preferred riverfront alignments of a system for a greenway. However, they said that they understood that variations may be needed in order to support a project with both riverside and roadside portions to the Greenway. The Woodfin Greenway is set to be at 65% design by this coming November, at which point right-of-way is set to begin, and we're working with approximately 23 property owners along the alignment path, which comes into some of the um, some of the constraints that we've had, which I'd like to demonstrate here through um, the looking of the Zillicoa Beer Company is one of those properties that we go through. Um, site constraints have been successfully navigated and presented to the public for feedback. So as we move into potential alignments, site constraints and considerations, such as distance from the railroads, railroad crossing, um, it's important to note that for every railroad crossing you make, you must take a railroad crossing offline somewhere else along the railroad track. Um, really important to note that. Um, and electrical constraints, such as what we experienced here at Zillicoa, alignment one um, largely follows the Craggy Mountain Railroad right of way through the back of Zillicoa Brewing, as you can see down here, um, near the railroad. Uh, Alignment two, while along the river, passes locations where there are several electrical distribution poles that created significant challenges in terms of required distance in order to be a viable option. Hence, alignment one was deemed the most viable option, even though it was not along the desired preferred river. However, it accomplishes our goals of completing the greenway through this area. Next, we look at Republic Services property, you can see here alignment A follows along the river. It requires an elevated structure and bridge and was not preferred by the company owners as they believed that it would have significant impacts on their operations. Alignment B utilizes the railroad easement through the property and crosses the main entry into Republic Services. Alignment C required two railroad crossings as well as the crossing of the entry into Republic Services and is directly adjacent to the road. Upon careful consideration, extensive public outreach and conversations with the folks at Republic Services and Craggy Mountain Railroad Line, it was determined that alignment B met the overall goals of the project and would be the most successful alignment for the project. Looking at the project timeline, you could see where um, we've gone through our preliminary design, we're in easement and acquisition will be coming up. As I said, right away, we'll start to begin in August with a full out um, uh, in November. And then we'll move into final design. And then construction will be fall of 2025 in its completion. Next, I'd like to talk about the Anka Recreation Destination, another project with a great amount of partners and um, significant collaborations across the county. Um, first, I want to note that it's really a truly unique and dynamic kind of recreation and sports greenway destination that has tournament quality play for baseball and soccer fields, along with the extended greenway network and community recreation amenities. There'll be connectivity. There'll be, it's an estimated $12 million project that's been funded from the FHWA, the MPO, and the TDA. It began in 2019 with an estimated completion date of phase one in 2024, and we are on target for that. Phase one components complete, uh, include the Lewis ball field lighting, the dog park, turf lighting um, of fields eight, one, and two, the restroom between fields two and eight, and the Anka Heritage Trail. 
So what we currently have going in progress right now are the restroom facilities and amenities between the new turf fields, which you could see with this yellow boxes. It's right between fields eight up at the top and fields one and two down below. There'll be player and visitor amenities, including lights adjacent to the fields and shade structures. And this is being funded through a TDA grant of $750,000. We're currently undergoing a paving and road entryways into the location. If you've not been, it's absolutely beautiful to see paved and striped parking lots at the site. Um, there are two more paved parking lots to be done in the main railway, but two of the larger parking lots have been completed. Um, and the county is funding this at a cost of approximately $1 million, and it was budgeted in this, this past fiscal year. Then we have the Anka Heritage Trail, which is in its preliminary engineering. We're doing archeological and environmental studies to find a viable alignment options based on some of the site constraints that we're finding. Um, and there's a secured funding of $6 million for that project. So components that have been completed. The Bob Lewis ball fields lighting sets were done and there's been ongoing play and tournament for over a year and a half. The dog park has been completed with shade structures. A restroom facility was installed over there as well as an EV charging station for county vehicles. One of the things that we're most proud of in this moment is the completion of the turf installation at fields one, two, and eight. The estimated first tournament was this past weekend. The Carpetbagger Lacrosse Men's Tournament was held there with over 3,000 players enjoying this turf. Um, and we're really looking forward to this coming weekend. There may be some rain, but not to worry because we have turf fields. The Women's Carpetbaggers Lacrosse Tournament will go on. Lighting installation has been completely done and is fully automated through the system. And I invite you all and anybody that's here or listening to please come to our grand opening and ribbon cutting celebration on July the 12th from six to seven um, at fields one and two. Um, it's gonna be a great time and there's gonna be activities for families as well as some nice cooling activities such as Kona ice. So what's next? Uh, we're looking to um, expansion and continuing priori prioritizing and phasing the remaining expansion items identified through the system-wide parks and recreation master plan. So with that, we're looking at turfing fields three, four, five, and nine. We're needing to assess fields six and seven as to whether turf or grass would be most effective based on it being in a floodway. And so we'll be assessing that to see how we'll progress. We'll be looking to light fields three, four, five, six, seven, and assess nine. An accessible walking path, inclusive playground, a picnic shelter replacement with lighting, concession building renovations, and eventually a parks and recreation office at, at the Buncombe County Sports Park where we may have locker rooms and public um, access. We have applied for TDA funding in the amount of $6 million, and we um, initiated our initial uh, ask and have been invited to participate in phase two. So we'll be completing the phase two application for those funds, which will be due in August. And then in September, we'll have a site visit along with the opportunity to do a presentation to the TDA. And then in October, we'll find out um, who is granted their awards. With that, I have a legend here that shows Blue shows the projects that we have completed in full. Um, orange are the projects that are currently in, project, in process and will be completed by the end of this year. And then looking again, phase two projects that I've just spoke about that will be going for TDA funding includes those field turfs and lighting. And then the yellow represents future phased products that we're interested in providing for the community. And with that, I'll open it to any questions that you might have. I, I have a couple. Yes, ma'am. So first of all, thank you. And these both look to be really um, exciting and important assets for our communities. And we definitely want to thank all the partners who've helped on both of these projects. And I've just always wondered about 
the phasing, the right of way acquisition. So hopefully you can explain that to me. I've always wondered why we don't do that earlier in the process. And so can you speak some to that with the right of way and being yeah. able, it just because when we think about it, I always think, well, why aren't we talking to folks and being able to ensure that we have the right of way that we need before we get so far in the project? But I'm right. sure there's a reason. Yeah, well, as part of the feasibility study, one of the things that occurs is looking at um, potential alignments and the possibility of those alignments through properties. And the identified properties are pointed out, and we actually do reach out to those folks at that time. And so what happens is during feasibility, you reach out and you gauge um, the temperature for people's willingness to have a greenway run through their property. Well, because you're looking at doing a feasibility study that can take up to a year or more, and then moving through phasing, I may come to a property owner and then who is very open to that idea, um, but we don't, we don't solidify until the alignment has been fully vetted out. And so by the time that comes and I come back to that property, a few things may have happened. That property owner may have sold and now you have a new property owner that may or may not have the same affinity for the greenway coming through, or a new business may have arisen over there or circumstances have changed. And so until the alignment is truly finalized and then we have the money in order to obtain right away after that feasibility and going through design and what is truly realistic. As you saw with Zillacoa and with Republic Services, there were several alignment possibilities. And until you get that final design about what's truly possible, um, you can't go out to get that right of way. But you're having conversations along the way with, with different property owners. Mm -hmm. And so is there any way in that process that you get some kind of letter of intent so that there's that no yeah, a lot, a lot of well, a lot of times it's 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 the verbal acknowledgement of of being on board and and being willing to support, and it's usually at that point that some of those community partners, and we've had that happen, that community partners step up and say, "Hey, we're for this greenway. We're allowing it through through our area, and would encourage you to allow it through yours, and um, and work with the community to to bring others on board." Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks. inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> Uh, the other question, oh, can you speak more to the, on the Inca, on that one, the actual Greenway? Is there a timeline with that, within that project? Yeah, so we've been working through um, different aspects of that. You've got to go through environmental testing and archaeological testing. And so um, that takes a while based on the findings that you have um, that are there. And so with that, Right now, we are scheduled for fiscal year 24 to start construction, and we anticipate that we'll be able to do that. Um, but much like Woodfin, there's a few constraints that we're working through and refining in order to be able to solidify that alignment. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Hey, thanks you. Thank you for the updates. Yep, really appreciate thank you. It. Uh, commissioners, that's everything that was on our agenda. So... The briefing meeting is adjourned and we will reconvene at five o'clock for our regular meeting.